right, I am back. Every time I say that now, I think of Rainless's comment. <laughs> Hello, back. All right, let's go. Ah, uh, so why why doesn't this work? It's a question. So there's no fields here. There should be. Let's take another look at the code. Maybe I'm missing something obvious here. So in stream silence detection input, in our components here, simple form iterator is the thing that we're supposed to use inside of uh, an array input, right? Let's have a look at another place where we're using array input. Uh, form iterator in line? Huh. Maybe, maybe that's the issue. We're just doing the wrong thing. <laughs> I suppose I could have checked the docs. But here we go. So this is probably going to work. And this will be another uh, a, a direct example of uh, AI generated code just being looking like it could be right, but just being wrong. Wait, what do you mean? Does it have any? Where's oh well, no, it is simple form iterator. Okay, then why? Shoot, disregard the thing I said then. <laughs> Uh, okay, so this simple form iterator. Um, are there? There are more props that we're supposed to pass in, right? Yeah, yeah. That's that's what it is. So React admin. When you pass an input field in a form. Right, so we're talking about like in uh, like edit over here. So we use stream silence detection input and we pass in the source. Well, this is all inside of a tab form, inside of a tab form, inside of edit. So there's some magic that these components do where they iterate over their components. Probably it's the, the tabbed subcomponent. They iterate over their, their child components and they rewrite the props to add additional things um, like, um, I forget the names of the props. I guess we could, if we look at like text input, we look at the definition for text input props. Uh, no, input props. Uh, ID, name, source, resource. Resource is the key one there, I think. So anyway, so there's some stuff that gets passed in and um, see how TypeScript feels about, uh, yeah, okay. Well, it's, it's defined, but it's never used, but that's fine. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do props to spread. The remaining props to array input. Essentially making this component um, pass anything that it, it didn't take here, like source uh, and task URL field name, and send it all into array input to make kind of uh, make this, this component look like a, a wrapper of array input effectively. And I think that's what's gone wrong here. Because like the form iterator and other stuff needs that information that array input will be responsible responsible for passing through. So I think that is the bit that's missing. We're gonna find out. That was the wrong window. Let's see, how about there? Okay, restart the front end. Uh, the other thing I could be doing here, so I didn't have to go into Docker to restart, restart the front end. Since it's using Vite, I could just run Vite like from a terminal and just like 
pass in the environment variables it needs, or make it like a .env file. I could do that. Um, but it's not so much of a hassle. It's not like it's completely instant for V to reload the front end either, so. Probably not gonna bother. All right, so if we refresh this now, it is. I could run a command, like Docker Compose restart, but uh, I'm still I'm still getting up to speed with this keyboard, so some things are a little faster. Just with a couple of clicks. Now, what's not fast is Firefox. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, if I wanted to run, that's what well, that's what I'm talking about. Is if I wanted to v run Vite not inside of Docker, right? Because running Vite inside of Docker, the way I have things set up with WSL2, um, it can't auto reload. It can't detect file changes. But I could just run it instead of a terminal outside of Docker. But then I would need like a .env file or something to provide the environment variables for it to be able to know where the backend is. And I could do that, and it would only take a couple minutes. Uh, I don't know that I want to bother. <laughs> Still nothing. That's a shame. Like we're obviously seeing the segments, the records there. So why why don't we have start and end? Errors, are lots lots of errors in the console. <laughs> Hold on, I gotta scroll down to um, errors that pertain to the thing that we're doing. Oh no, it's bugged. Let's let's load results again. There we go. Um, so the React admin knows that we get, like have a field on the summary tab that has to do with the topics, which are like tags for the streams. But I've not implemented the backend, so we're getting errors about that. Um, and that's it. So you can see there's, here's a, an order list of all of our segments. Section span, section form iterator, span, span. So what am I doing wrong here in this array input? Uh, oh, it's a text field. Finally, I have an example of <laughs> this is wrong because this should be this should be a text input, right? Pretty sure. I don't think text field even works in that context. There is a text field like component, but it's for like a read-only view, not inside of like not nested inside of a, an array input. There are other ways if we wanted to like statically render. Uh, some of the value inside of the entry to do that, uh, but not like this. <laughs> All right. Okay, and fine. I will. Um, let's let's look at making an environment variable file for the front end. I think V will handle loading uh, that. And I'm pretty sure it's safe for me to open the Docker Compose file on stream. The real secret is an open AI key. <laughs> All right, so for the front end, it's just these things. There's not a lot actually. Uh, there we go. We don't need node env. All right, so that 
should be enough that if we were to um How would we make this work? We could stop the front end. Bye bye front end. Confused why localhost? Well, because it's the it's from the browser's perspective, right? So this environment variable is not. This is a front end application, right? So the front end isn't running anything behind the scenes inside of Docker. Yeah. This is to pass to the browser to tell the browser how to find the API backend. And it happens to be localhost because I'm just running everything locally. And you can't have my IP address. <laughs> All right, so if I uh, CD into front end, uh, we'll run npm install just for a good measure. npm install. And then I should be able to do npm run dev. And this might actually work. Oh good, and localhost 3000. So is that the right, that's a different port now. Does it load? Uh, and it's 3000 because of course in our v config we set the port to always be 3000 rather than generating one because i kept on having issues yeah that's normal uh that's not normal though oh yeah cores no maybe browser frozen first of all Is the front end calling the back end by host name? Uh, I mean, it is because why? Hmm. Yeah, let's take a look at what's going on here. Uh, there we go. Yeah, so cores issues <laughs> prevent all this from working. Uh, previously, that wouldn't have been a problem because the, the front end and the back end were hosted through Nginx. And so they were on the same host and port. It's not just the host name, but it's also the port. Uh, because of course, they're both the front end and back end are on local host, but they're different ports now because I'm running V locally. The solution for this generally is probably like, I think there's a way to have V proxy the back end. Maybe we could do that. But th this is what I was, <laughs> this is what I was avoiding by, you know, just going into the Docker uh, console and restarting. Uh, yeah, so vconfig, there should be a way to, Proxy, there we go. What about using Nginx to proxy, but change the config to call the local version? Um, how would an Nginx running inside of the Docker container proxy the external host? I mean, I guess I could, but I think this will work. Um, if we save this, and then we go back to the env file and we say, oh no, no, just 3000 slash API, then this should work. Uh, and let's restart that. Yep, and that's normal. It's not 8000, is it? It's 8080.
I would need to do some testing to answer that. I am not on the work laptop. Well, that's fine. I think this will work once Firefox comes back. Someday Firefox will be back. One day, I believe. Hey, look, it loads. I think I might just close this tab. <laughs> Maybe it's the tab. The tab is overloaded. See? <laughs> money if you're still listening I did I did get some water and I have been hydrating so your your points have not been in vain I just wanted you to know oh good browser's back all right so let's let's just abandon this tab <laughs> let's have a new tab and uh, there we go go back to here it does still take a second to load because there's a lot of stuff going on How's the keyboard adjustment process going? I think better. I, I need to go back and do another like word per minute test. Um, but I think better overall. All right, that didn't work. Guess why? <laughs> because check status gets a URL and then tries to use it. And that doesn't work because cores. All right. Okay, we're gonna go back to the other way, unfortunately, for now, until I decide to do something else. Uh, let's go back to terminal first and quit out of this. Um, do I need to remove this? I think we could probably leave this. This just won't be accessible. Uh, not following why it's not possible to do the same within a running container. I mean, the proxy. Which part? I mean, we do have the front end running in a container. The issue is that Vite, the, not the whole point, but one of the nice things about it is that when we make a code change, it immediately reloads. Yeah, the hot reload. Uh, and that doesn't work. Um, it's not supported. Detecting file changes is not supported th when running in Docker on files that are on a non-WSL file system. <laughs> like the files are just in a folder, right? They're not inside of WSL. If the files were inside WSL, I could have VS Code connected to that. I could I could move things around. I just can't be bothered to do that. It's not worth the hassle to change how I do things. Yeah, it's it's Windows. Um and the front end container doesn't show up anymore, so I'll have to go back to here and get that back. Uh, Docker compose up front end. Should have passed dash D to it. I don't I don't care about stopping it, I just wanna leave it. <laughs> Alright. There we go. Alright, so we should have a front end container again. And uh yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Alright. We're back. Alright, check status. Load results. Hey, hey, all right. It's not 
what I wanted, but it loads the data. <laughs> the reason I didn't want to really do, I, oh, you're whispering me a link, okay. Oh, there you are. Uh, looks like a beat issue. Yep, not working. Yep, yep, I feel like I've read this one. Uh, yeah, that doesn't work. Yeah, adding, first of all, Ch Ch Chukadar watch options is no longer a thing. That's out of date. Uh, and then add use polling does not work. Uh, if you, uh, the, the last comment is relevant though. Here, let me just move this thing. Right, so, um, I have read this before, <laughs> before. If you move your files into the, the Linux file system, so inside of WSL, you won't have this problem. Uh, yeah. Right, so if I, like, inside of WSL, there's like a separate file system, and you could have your files in there. In fact, you can have like VS Code connected to that. You can do all sorts of things. Um, that's an option, but that would require that I change something. <laughs> uh, and I could, I just haven't bothered. Uh, I guess the next time I'm annoyed by the lack of uh, hot reload, that'll be the next thing to try. Since, uh, it seems troublesome to not use Docker, given how things are set up. The other option would be we could we could use Vite locally, and then um, make up fake host names and set up cores. Guess it's just a pain caused by Windows. Yeah, basically, Windows and WSL. I mean, WSL is not better than nothing. Okay, so uh, what was I saying? Uh, the silent segments. What I wanted to do here was not this, because th this is not helpful. <laughs> All right, we have a silence starting at 395 seconds and ending at 300 and, uh, or three, 935 seconds and ending two seconds later. Uh, and it's interesting. I don't think these are out of order. I think something. I think what we need, honestly, is a better view, right? I think that's where, where I was going with this, is that we need to do some like front-end design to design a component that's gonna show this information. And I think the answer is just like a timeline. Um, yeah, a timeline. which we probably are going to need a couple of timeline-like components uh, for different places in the UI. So that, that's gonna be helpful. Um, so while I leave part of my brain to kind of ponder that, <laughs> set that, that assignment going, we can... Uh, <laughs> We can figure out, so I'm pretty sure these are in the right order. And then what's happened here is that this value, yeah, yeah. So, well, you could have, so we could do maybe, we could do SVG. There's no need for a line graph. No, I mean, just like, there's nothing to plot. No, just there's silence or there's not. So we need just like a vertical uh, or a horizontal bar and then segments on the bar where there's silence. And then we need, uh, this would be something like in the past, like years ago, uh, when I was doing a lot of stuff with D3, this is like, oh, we use D3. And we could do that. Is D3 a thing people use? anymore. It's been a few years since I've used it, but that gives you a lot of utilities for like doing, uh, dividing, uh, like setting up dimensions and, and, and stuff. 
Uh, but let's let's sort this this time issue because I'm pretty sure is that a is that a shrug? <laughs> I guess it it really doesn't matter. Who cares if no one uses it anymore? I don't know if I want to use it either. But we'll we'll, we'll think about that a little bit. I want to fix the back end issue though. Um, kind of mix things up a little bit. We've been doing a lot of front end stuff, so the back end, finally. So the silence detection API, um, we're just calling ffmbag and we're pulling data out uh, per video file, right? And so uh, somewhere in here we are, here, here we go. So we parse duration and end from the output from ffmpeg uh, by using a regular expression. And then we say start is end minus duration. These are always within the context of the individual video file that's being processed, right? So uh, as a recap, we have an API that you tell it, here's a video file. Actually, you give it a list of video files then you tell it which one in the list to use. It takes that video file, it finds a specific audio track, it filters for lengths of silences in that uh, audio track, and then it captures when the silence ended and how long the silence was, and then we, you know, do uh, a little arithmetic to get the start, and we accumulate a list. And so the list should be in ascending order, like in, in uh, chronological order rather, within the video file. And then we have a separate API down here that is responsible for dispatching out to the task API to say, go process all the files. And then um, there should be something somewhere that fixes up the data. Now, I think maybe I'm wrong about where we need to make the change, right? So in, because we don't do that, we wouldn't do that in the, um, oh, I, I think I remember. So in the transcription API, I think we changed the, um, the, the lower level endpoint, the one that does a single file, to have an additional input called video duration so that each call you would say how how long the video has gone on so far so that you could add that video duration to the uh, the start time so that the end result like once all of the data was pulled together would be relative to the overall uh, stream or the set of videos that you were processing anyway Start offset plus video duration. So I think we just need to bring this change into silence detection. Now this is, since we're, we only have two of these right now, <laughs> since we only have two of these right now, I'm still okay with just kind of copying and pasting stuff between them. I think if we were to make a third one of these, we'd really want to consider how to extract some of the common logic for this kind of operation. Um, at least if we're doing all of these APIs in a single language. Or if we weren't, I think it could be interesting to think about how you could extract kind of the logic of this into a service, but that might get messy. It may not be practical. And it's, it's just down to trade-offs, right? Uh, how much data are you gonna have to pass around to make an abstract service that's gonna manage those so that you can take advantage of reuse? across your microservices in a uh, heterogeneous <laughs> language environment, which this is not, right? All of our backend APIs are in Rust, um, which was not my original intent. I was thinking we'd use some Python, um, and maybe we'll use some other languages out if we need to do more services. Uh, that might be something fun to do. Okay, so the text is kind of the top level endpoint. I don't think we need to make 
Uh, do we need to make any changes here? I don't think so. Oh, this is silence detection. So let's look over here at transcription. Because I feel like there was something. Um, here we have a function kit. Video iteration. How does this work? Okay. Yeah, I think the top level endpoint, we didn't need to change anything because we're using the cursor. So when you call the, the lower level API from the task API, or the task worker calls the lower level API, the first time it gets back a cursor that it uses to make the second call. Um, so that means that the top, the, the high level thing that dispatches out to the task API doesn't need to know anything about that, which is why there are no changes there. Now we have this get video duration function. This is something that I would want to pull out uh, because it has nothing to do with specifically the transcription API. Um, is, is there a crate that we are using? Yeah, common API lib. So let's move this function to common API lib. Um, in the absence of, like, I don't want to create a separate crate just for a single function. We could do that some, some other time. Uh, so I'm just going to create a file called media.rs. And we'll have that function there. And it's going to be missing imports and stuff or uses. Uh, and other things perhaps. Let's see, and lib.rs needs to also declare pubmod media. All right, and then auto resorts, that's fine. Uh, are we really not referring to any other um, Oh yeah, command, okay. Import, Tokyo process command. Uh, let's see, this needs to be pub. For public. Well, that was easy. All right, so now, done with that file as well. Uh, somewhere, there should now be an error because we are not, let's get a little bit more space here. Uh, somewhere there should be an error, let's save. There we go. Get video duration, doesn't exist, but we can fix that by importing it. Which ended up right here, seems fine. Okay. So the relevant bits here um, that we need to copy over are the start offset for the cursor, because we'll need that for silence detection as well. So the part that we just did there was kind of just like a little bit of refactoring to make it easier to like sync these things across. Um, although in the past, <laughs> I've definitely said, and I think it's true, that it's not really refactoring if there aren't unit tests. And I've not been doing any tests for any of this because um, I'm being lazy. Ooh. Hey. P33 just follow. P33, thank you for the follow. Hope you've been having a good Sunday. All right. Uh, let's collapse down these things that I don't think I need to see. Task. It's a little bit of dupl duplication. Uh, main shouldn't need to be changed. Yeah, so there we go. Cursor. So we're gonna I'm just gonna copy paste, and then uh, yeah, we can see here. Cursor is also used. The kind of the details of the input for the different APIs are different, right? So for the, the transcription one, we have like language and initial prompt, and for silence detection, we have noise and duration. It's kind of like filter options. I think none of the other things here change. Um, 
Do I not have a, uh, an output struct somewhere? Maybe I don't. Oh, I see. Hey, uh, a, a gunner? Hey, how can I manage DOM nodes of user project for no code platform? Shouldn't it be in a uh, Redux store? Um, so DOM nodes of a user project for no code platform. Uh, React. <laughs> well, that's an interesting question. Can you tell me a little bit more? Because so a no code platform. So that that could mean a couple of different things, but it's, I'm I'm presumably. I'm, I'm presuming though, if you're talking about making any kind of code changes, then there must be some kind of escape hatch or some way of injecting at least front end code into it. Uh, but that's, that's not really enough to go off of. Also welcome in. Welcome to the stream. So if you, if you could share a little bit more, I might be able to, to, to take a swing at that. Um, okay, so what else do we need to change in the code? So the cursor isn't happy now because we're not passing in this. So more copy paste. All right, I was trying to figure out why so on one of these, we've defined a struct that defines the output, detect segment output. I guess we are, what are we doing with cursor here? Oh, do we not? I think we're just, this has a little bit more, right? So in this API, we're checking to make sure that um, we actually have some files to process. <laughs> And if we don't, we're returning something. And I guess I wanted to construct the output shape there. And we're not doing that over here. Okay. Probably we should do more input validation, but uh, we should be doing a lot of things. <laughs> okay. Um, we are checking to make sure the cursor index is within the length of body URIs, or that if it's not, that we're throwing an error. Although I guess we're not checking that the cursor is uh, positive. So that's also a gap. Uh, anyway, so just changing the shape of the um, the cursor struct has, has surfaced some things. So like if we look at, um, we can also copy paste the video duration Obtaining code, uh, probably keep that up here, kind of near the top. I wonder if there's a way, I mean, potentially, you, we're, we're already calling FFmpeg. I wonder if there's a way to have it also tell us the duration and extract it out, but that would make this operation more complicated. So I don't know if that's worthwhile. Okay, so let's try saving that. And then of course we need to import or add a, a use or whatever the syntax is. Yeah, use common API lib media, get video duration. So now we have the video duration. And so when we return the cursor, we want to take the start offset of the cursor and add the video duration. Yeah, so we're saying when we're done, like when we return from this API, the cursor is gonna contain kind of the, the, the um, how long the, the overall set of videos have been so far. Yeah. Okay, that's gonna make that error go away. Now, the bit that uh, Russ isn't going to tell us is um, because we've not changed like the structure of the enum for the segments, but we do want 
to add the offset to start. Now, we are returning start and end, not start and duration. So we want to add the video duration, uh, or not the video duration. We want to add the cursor start offset to the start and end. So we do get a uh, STD time duration here. So if we add cursor start, oops, cursor start offset to the start, we also need to add it to the end. And that Rust Analyzer seems fine with. So I think this will this will uh, make it so that all of the ISO 8601 values we get back from the API will be um relative to the start of the whole set of videos rather than being offset from from the beginning of each one now now we have to build everything everything or at least uh silence detection api uh, let's see build yeah that one there we go. is it going to take to build today so once this is built we can go into the ui and re-trigger the um the silence detection scan and get new data this, this was something i was going to talk about when we were looking at the ui before the way this is set up um we did run the silence detection task and so the task result is stored in redis but it's not yet stored in the database in our like stream record. So like when I refresh this, these silent segments aren't hanging around. Once, once we get back. <laughs> um, and that, that is a, an intentional thing, right? That means that we can like, okay, we can pull the results We could pull the results. It's it's thinking. Okay, interesting. There we go. Okay, so it sees that the previously queued task was completed. We can load results, and then that allows us to to review the data, and update it if necessary or correct it um, before we save it into the stream record. Right. So we have kind of a a review step. And if we don't save it, um, the raw data from the task is still there until we start a new silence detection pass run through. All right, are we, are we built? Probably not. Yep, still building. Uh, I think our Docker file is just targeting latest for our Rust containers. Docker file Rust. Yeah, it's just targeting latest. So probably what's happening <laughs> every stream, like every week, there's probably a new latest tag, and so we have to redo a build. Um, a thing that I could do is I could probably have um, 
something similar to what I did for Daily Jewel, a project we were working on before, where I am using GitHub Actions and I have a uh, container repository there and just have a freshly built version of the base, like have a base image that everything would share. That would, um, because we have some customizations here, right? So we have like, uh, uh, here we go, for the, this runtime. Oh, that that might be the other thing. It's the, the Debian Bookworm, Bookworm Slim that's being updated. And then we're installing OpenAI Whisper and we're you know doing various setup. That could be built as a base image, um, separate from this, in fact. And then instead of from Debian Bookworm Slim, uh, I could use my custom image that's being built on the regular, kind of offline, with these steps in place. Um, the parts that we wouldn't be able to reuse would be like, uh, I guess the service name stuff, the user, like all of this stuff could be moved into like a base image. But the service name specific stuff is being driven by the build step for the specific image. Without that, that's very fast to do versus, you know, this. <laughs> But hey, you know, every time we have a build, it's an opportunity to, to step back and take a little break from being, you know, very focused on a thing. Just kind of take a pause, think about what we're doing. Uh, so hopefully that the changes to the silence detection API will work well. Um, and then the next thing to do, I guess, is to swing back to the front end and figure out how we're going to um, render out things. I guess I'll just leave this in the background. And so is D3 still a thing? I'm sure it still exists, right? It's now D3 by observable. Ooh. <laughs> so why would you use D3? Uh, my recollection of in the past, doing a lot of um, graphing either for dashboards or for um, any kind of UI where you just want to show some raw data, you want to summarize it, you want to visualize it. And we have a little bit, a little bit of that going on and probably we're going to want more, right? As we get more and more data um, from streams, potentially even bringing in like analytics results. Um, might be a fun thing to do like um, so for those that don't know like as a streamer you can go into uh, the twitch um, like stream dashboard console thingy and there's like all sorts of metrics on like average number of views and top views and um, those sorts of things chats and all, all of that and so that could be a thing that if I wanted to build a, a general stream management tool beyond the, the, the one use case that I'm working on right now in terms of managing uh, the stream recordings and processing them and AIing them, uh, that could be a thing to do. Uh, and I'm, I know there's a bunch of stuff out there. Um, but my, so my recollection about D3, right, is that it provides a lot of utilities for doing these things that it's talking about here. So like scales and axes and interactions and uh, geographic maps and, and things like that. Now in the past, as I was doing more stuff, because when I was using D3, we weren't using React. I think, I think we had some Angular JS if I recall correctly, at the startup I was working at. And um, so we had specific things where we were building views. Was it, was it Angular? Was it Angular? I think because it was CoffeeScript and Angular and D3. 
But with React, there's there's some things around, you know, the virtual DOM and re-rendering that kind of touches on some of the behaviors you get with kind of the examples. Like if we look at examples of D3 code, what would be a relevant example to kind of what I want to do here? Some kind of timeline? <laughs> That's a wild uh, view. Um, what I'm thinking of is something very similar where it's just kind of like, um, and C3 might be over overkill for this. The thing that I'm thinking about this specifically is having um, a zoomable timeline that has um, like uh, axes that show like the amount of time elapsed. And that feels like something that might be it might be very helpful to use D3 for, but we could do it without. Like we could just use, not even SVG, we could just use CSS and DOM elements and um, just go from there. But then we're gonna have to do a lot of calculation as we kind of enhance that. This is now on observable HQ. Is there a way to search? Find and replace, okay. Does that, that, does that take us back to the same place? Community. I guess another consideration, right? This is an open source project anyway. What if there's a, a good like timeline view that we could just use? Data, animation, interaction, visualization, chord, interpolate contour, force geo hierarchy path, polygon quad tree scale, shape. Um, so how would I go about finding something? We could use like ChatGPT and it might make up something for us. Uh, D3 timeline examples could be a good thing. We could also, I mean, you could always go to like npmjs and just search for like timeline. Um, let's see. Take a look at some things here. Oh, observable, scrollable D3 timeline. So that, that is a timeline. How is it scrollable? Ah, we can, we can mouse wheel. Can we pan? Okay. So something like this would be good, right? Not at. Four billion years but <laughs> in the scope of like a couple of hours um what we probably want would not be points though we would want well there are regions here right somehow so what does this code look like uh let's see so we are we're gonna have to take a break here in a minute let's let's uh is the build done it is. All right. So let's let's see if we actually made a thing that works. Let's also check to see the service restarted. It should have. Silence detection last 33 minutes ago. Okay. So what we can do is we can just start detect silences. There we go. A foxy still here. Um, that's weird that it cleared the fields. Check status. Okay, it's running. Hold on, let me X out all of this. Clear the list, yep. Check status. Okay, I think this is gonna be a good time for a break because we're, this is gonna take a couple of minutes to uh, load anyway. Uh, and I uh, can think a little bit about what we wanna do with the, uh, the UI part of this and 
by the time the break is over, maybe we will have detected all the silences and we'll see if the data looks right. All right, be back in just a few minutes.